the seven marks? Y'all doing all right? Nice, man. Make some noise for the Lord, man. I'm glad to be here today. Glad to be with you. Oh, and make a little more noise for the worship band and production team. They're killing it up here. This is crazy. Um, I'm happy to be with you, man. My name uh, uh, is, uh, like Paul said, I go by Legend. I'm a rap artist and a speaker, but I do that because my name is Nigel. Uh, Legend is just Nigel spelled backwards. It's as creative as I wanted to get with it. And uh, you flip it backwards, and it just says, Jesus, turn my life around. That's the whole point of that. So, uh, <laughs> so I've been friends with Caleb for some years. That's my guy. We've done some work together, and I had the privilege of knowing Paul for a long time. We met last week. And uh, so just really happy to be uh, here with you and uh, be a part of this self selfless series. So, um, hey, man, uh, I come from church to where they're, they're, when you walked in, you didn't know when you was walking out. Amen, anybody? No clocks on the wall, there's no program, you just follow the spirit the whole time and you just don't know when you're leaving. Might be late to work on Monday, you don't know. But um, Paul said this is second service and there's nothing coming up, so, so uh, I can hold y'all a little bit. They're locking the doors as we speak, there is no escape. So for the next two and a half hours, I'm excited to talk with you up now. Um, look, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you, man. This is fun. Uh, uh, I, uh, my wife and I uh, and my kids are here and uh, we're celebrating 16 years of marriage next, next week. And uh, yeah, man, super happy. Uh, met, her, met her in seventh grade, started dating in 12. She didn't like me in seventh grade. That, that, was, that was her loss, but she, you know. Um, but just really excited to be here with you to talk about this aspect of togetherness. Reconciliation is a really big conversation for me. And it can go a whole lot of different directions. Uh, but what we can already agree on off jump is that we are living and looking at an unreconciled world. Amen? Amen. Uh, there is no... Uh, unity, there's division, all, all the things. Pick your poison, pick your issue, whatever you want to do. I just have a strong sense, biblically, that the Lord called us to better than that. Amen? Um, I expect uh, culture to, to be in boxes and, and to do things. I don't, I don't, I don't think that culture is going to ever get the reconciliation conversation right. I think the left is messing it up. I think the right is messing it up. But what I do hope for and expect is that the people of God who have these, this book would be working harder than culture to get it right. And my prayer is that myself, uh, I don't stand here as a master of this. I stand here with my own issues in the topic at all. So I probably shouldn't be preaching to you. But uh, I know that Jesus pushes us to better than what we're seeing in the culture. And I pray that if the church can get it together, um, maybe we can see that spill over. We can duplicate what, what Christ has for us in, in, in the house and in the body. Does that make sense? So I'd love to pray for us, and I want to dive in, and, and hopefully we'll all leave encouraged. So let's do that. Uh, Lord, we are extremely grateful uh, that you promised us whenever two or three gather, you're there. That you never leave us or forsake us, so you're there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. I, where can I go from your presence? And Lord, I just thank you that you would sacrifice everything to reconcile us to yourself and then tell us the next best thing you can do after that is live in love with each other. Uh, so I pray, God, that as your church, we walk in the reconciled paradigm that you paid for and that we would invite everybody around us into it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So has anybody ever asked yourself this question, what does God have for me? What am I supposed to do? What's next? What's my purpose? Show of hands, anybody ever had that? Oh, a whole bunch of honest saints in here. Oh, uh, that's good. That's good. Um, I think that no matter how that ends up in, in the different layers in which God plays it out for you, that this verse rings true for all of us. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19 gives us a very clear indicator of purpose. Uh, the Holy Spirit writes it this way. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's our job gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them because he paid the debt for it. And then again, he repeats, he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us that work, the ministry, the service of reconciling. The Bible gives us this crazy clear picture in Revelation about what, the, what we're all heading towards and what we're going to see happen. It doesn't matter what side of what aisle you sit on and what you think about this, that, and the third topic and who you disagree with and who you agree with and what you're fighting for. It doesn't matter. It says if you're in Christ, 
this is the end, Revelation 7, 9. And I looked, John says, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, tongue, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The beautiful thing about this verse is he did not have to put every nation, tribe, people. He could leave that out and the verse still rings true. He put it in there to say, listen, man, um, I see everybody that named the name of Jesus here. I see everybody that repented and believed here. And they are from all these places, places I've never even been to around the throne. I couldn't even count the number of people. That's what we're heading to. We've got 70, 80, 90, 100 years here, right? And then we're going to see that. Hello? Then we celebrate that. We're going to see that one day. God is going to do that is, 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 is what's happening. But what about right now? Why here are we so split? Why can't we talk about things? Why can't we get together and work on things? Why can't people who have slightly different views or largely massively different views even get together in the same room when this is something that Jesus promises us is coming? He even tells his disciples one day, Jesus has this group of 12 people. They're walking around, they're hanging out, and, and they're seeing Jesus raise the dead and do like miracle fish fries on the mountain. You know what I'm saying? Like when I read my Bible, it's a big fish fry when he multiplied the fish and the sandwich. So that's how I read it. So it's a big old fish fry, and, he's do, and, they're, and they're seeing all these miracles, but then they're like, hey, man, we don't know how to pray. How, do, how are we supposed to pray? And Jesus says, hey, man, pray this. Pray uh, on earth. Pray as you're, as you're praying for your forgiveness, and you're saying, hey, God, please forgive me as I've already actively forgiven everybody else because that was what he expected. He says, pray on earth as is in heaven. Like, believe for the Father to duplicate what, he, what John is seeing in Revelation 7. Ask him to duplicate that now. And what we have to understand is we're not going to see that happen perfectly. It's not gonna, we're not going to see it perfectly. But Jesus says, fight, labor, pray. Of the six points of the Lord's Prayer, I, this needs to be one of them. Pray on earth as in heaven right now. All submitted to the Father in this. It's really important, I think, to heaven that we figure this out or at least intentionally work towards it and not end up in our corners, which we'll talk about in a bit. Because Jesus makes a promise. There's, there's, there's Revelation 7-9, there's on earth is in heaven, there's this unity that the church, only, only the big C church can actively fight for. Only walking in the spirit of God can we do and replicate. Only knowing the purposes of God can we do that. So that's, that's on anybody who takes the name of Christ and puts that on their back. So there's that of when, when you're in my orbit, when we're together, what you see everybody else doing, that's not what we're doing. There's a different type of unity and peace here. Even if we disagree, we, 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 we're walking different. The opposite, the other option is what Jesus warned, it about, warned us about, which is what I see when I look out. He says, listen, Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. That's country, that's family, that's household, that's city, that's church. And I see a massive amount of division with people excited about which side of the divide they're on while giving glory to Jesus. Something's off. And I just think we need, we need, to, we need to be honest about that and, and adjust it. So if I get this conversation wrong, please email me. Like I can, you know, do your worst. My email is paul at sevenmarkschurch.com, and yeah, I'll be happy to respond in any way. <laughs> and just gave him a fun week right there. So I was, um, I was asking this interview one time, if you were allowed to say one thing to the church, and after that you couldn't say anything to the church for the rest of your life, but everybody had to listen, what would you say? And my answer is, was and still is, repent of political idolatry. Repent of political idolatry. Everybody loves talking politics in church. Here we go. So, uh, I'm joking. But uh, repent of political idolatry. What, what is, what, why, why are we so, we can't even talk about race and justice and da-da-da. We can't even get there until we get here. And, and pick your, whatever issue you want to talk about, 2A, pro-life, you can't even get there until we get this situation situated. Because we're, 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 we're so split on things. When you say a certain trigger word, you're put into a box, you're lumped over there, you're this, you're that, and we can't even talk, even though we name the name of Jesus and we're going to be spending forever together right here. We can't have coffee and talk about this because you voted for them and they like that. And I'm just, it's, it's to the point where I am, I am frustrated. And um, 
I just, I just think, I think Jesus died for, for, for more than that. Um, the church is busy splitting on things that are important because these things are important. Busy splitting on things that are important instead of unifying on things that are essential. Whether that's split, yeah, the church is busy splitting on things that are important instead of unifying on things that are essential. Whether that split is, is left to right, uh, blue to red, conservative to liberal, blood to crip, I don't care. It's all the same to me. They're splitting over blocks or seats in the house, whatever. Like, it's, it's, we're fighting over the same stuff. It's, it's irritating, man. One just looks neater, right? One's more acceptable because they got suits on. We're doing this, and, and I, don't, I don't know if Jesus wanted us to box people that he died for into liberal and this and that. And it's, you know, those things, I mean, I get it. They're identifiers, but when we find our identity in them, we're a little off. The Bible tells us, by contrast, Ephesians 4, 3, to make every effort, every effort, not the one that's applicable and acceptable and comfortable, but every, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And listen, we have, I have, I have stuff that I'm super convicted on that I, you're not going to change my mind, period, right? I got those things. And we, so we have amazing justifications. We even got some Bible verses to back up why we do that to each other. Um, but Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that appears to be right <laughs> to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So uh, any, any Tim Keller fans in here? Anybody like Tim Keller? Tim Keller, he's a, great, he's a great author, preacher. I love listening to him. Uh, he wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods, which I thought was fantastic. Check it out if you get a chance. Really good book. But in it, he highlighted this thing of political idolatry, and he basically said, it's when you glorify or demonize a candidate or a position. All right? You glorify or demonize a candidate or a position. He says this, another sign of idolatry in our politics is that the opposite are not considered to be simply mistaken, but to be evil. They're not just wrong, they're evil antichrist Satan worshipers who do X, Y, and Z. Now, to be clear, the Bible is very clear about this. There's definitely some evil politicians out there. Like, let's, let's not skip over that. But he says, it, just because somebody disagrees with you, they're the very embodiment of evil. There's another quote in the book that says, the Bible views sin, sin as the primary problem in the world. Political idolatry, on the other hand, turns a political ideology into the main problem. Instead of seeing God as the ultimate solution, it sees something else, a rival ideology, a political victory, a politician, etc., as the ultimate solution. And when this happens, our opponents don't just disagree with us, but they represent the very embodiment of evil. It's not somebody Jesus died to save that he thought was worth giving his eternal, perfect blood for, but just a worthless whatever they are that we need to get rid of. Something's off when people of God are doing that. This guy named Kevin Holleran, he wrote a, 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 a blog, which I go to a lot. It says, 20 signs you've made politics an idol. Uh, I do a lot of reconciliation talks, and I feel like this is like the 30,000 foot. If we don't get here, we can't get there. The 20 sign you made politics an idol. He goes through all these things that read your mail, yours and mine. I can't read that list without going, oh, that's me. <laughs> Half of this is me. Uh, but he says this, you think every one of your opponents is as bad as their worst party's example. And one of your opponents is as bad as their worst. So it's not just people who think differently than this. They, every single one of them like killing babies. Every single one of them hate minorities. Every single one. You know what I mean? Hello? Am I losing y'all? You sure? I'm going to go home after this. I remember my email is Paul at seven months. I'd add another one to this. I'd add another one. I like apologetics. Um, one, of, one of the big signs to me that we are slipping into political idolatry is when you're a better apologist for your candidate than you are the Christ. You're a better apologist for your candidate. You can prove to me why this, this guy or gal does it. You can prove it with every, you got the stats and all that, but you can't prove to me biblically, historically, journalistically why we should trust the scriptures and why we should believe Jesus got about the grave. And you get more frazzled when somebody disagrees with your candidate than when somebody says, I don't think Jesus is Lord. You get more bothered and passionate about that, something's off. I think that God has better for us than that. You want to do a really frightening, like, YouTube thing? Go to YouTube, pick an issue, type it in the search bar, then add an a, a outlet of choice, one you watch and one you don't watch. Enter it, click a video. Don't look at the video, but just read the comments. 
and then enter said issue again, switch out the news outlet, and read the comments. What you'll find is all the comments and arguments fall up in three to five bullet points, and they're all the same, and you find out how programmed we are by the outlets you like and the ones you don't like. It's really weird to see. Now, here's the thing. I don't blame the media for that. I don't blame social media for that. I mean, there definitely is evil stuff. Watch The Social Dilemma on Netflix if you haven't, about the algorithm and the stuff they're doing. It's really intriguing. But social media, media, news, yes, they are, yes, they're pandering. They're, they're getting advertisers and getting eyeballs and making money. That's what they do. But they only give us what we tell them we want. The algorithm responds to how long you look at a thing when you're scrolling past it and what you click, friend groups, what they like. The media, like, I, I asked a friend, uh, she, she's in news. I said, hey, man, why don't y'all put more good news up front? Like, why y'all keep starting with murder, death, kill, the bus is on fire? Like, what are you doing? Like, and she said, because y'all don't want that. She said, we know the second we go away from the drama and the division and all that, the second we say, you know, somebody saved a kitten in the tree and helped the old lady across the street, the plummets go down. I mean, the, the ratings go down, they plummet. She said, we got to pay bills. So we give y'all what you say you want. Even though you email us saying, why don't we put more good news up front? It was really intriguing to me. I don't think it's the media's fault. I think it's us. I think we're the media. And we want an enemy, but I think it's us. So what do we do, man? I had a mentor, uh, Dr. Jack Gaines. Uh, he passed away March 20, uh, right, right when you know, COVID was kicking off. He passed away. Uh, not because of COVID. He's just, it's just the month he, he exited. Uh, this man was a, he was the second black pitcher on the Boston Red Sox on the major league roster. He was in Chesapeake. Around the Jackie Robinson era was kind of when he was playing. Got signed at 19. And um, you can imagine at that time, he went through a whole lot of hell. He went through some stuff, right? Um, and I, we don't, I don't have time to go through the stories. Uh, you can already imagine it probably. But uh, so if anybody has a right to be bitter and angry, it would be, it would be Jack Gaines. You have to give him a pass and be like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you there. I'm just going to let you have this one, right? I've never met anybody. more passionate about the reconciliation of the body than Dr. Jack Gaines. I've never seen anybody fight harder for it. I've never met anybody more loving. I've never met anybody who had more of a right to just live angry and bitter and point fingers and all that stuff. And he would have been right about some of it, but he just didn't do it. He was like, man, look, Jesus ain't died for that. What Jesus died for was every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we're going to go see it, so why am I going to waste time here not living it? He put together reconciliation conferences. He would come into a room and he would say with the sweetest voice stuff that made everybody, nobody was safe, left, right, center, none, nobody. And he would say, and everybody's in, oh, you know, they're feeling it. And at the end, everybody wanted to be more like Jesus and more like him. And I loved watching every minute of it. He, 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 had, he, led, he led conferences in European countries and America and African countries. And he actually took a group of 100 some African Americans from here back to one of the countries in Africa that sold their ancestors on the transatlantic slave trade and organized a reconciliation conference where uh, the ancestors of that country apologized to the African Americans for what they did and they all re repented and believed and trust Jesus. I was, this is what, this is how he lived his life. And one thing he would say to me is this, this is what I want to leave with you. He would say, reconciliation isn't a man-to-man -man proposition. It's a God-to-man proposition. Reconciliation isn't a man-to-man -man proposition. It's a God-to-man proposition. Like this reconciled paradigm is not something we can manufacture by getting people on our team or doing the right things or passing the right laws. It doesn't, none of that, it doesn't, it hasn't worked yet. It's not going to work tomorrow. It doesn't work now. But he says, man, when you get the, the vertical right, love the Lord your God with all your heart, then love my neighbor as myself. Love my neighbor as myself. You see the cross right in the greatest commandment. Right there. So what, what holds us back? Here's, here's the, the picture I hope is helpful. And then I want to talk to us about how we hopefully walk out of it. I think my pastor and I, um, Kevin, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a Virginia Beach area. I live in Virginia Beach. The church I serve is in Norfolk. It's called Crossroads Church. Not this one. It's a couple blocks that way. But, you know, the real one, the Norfolk mine. I'm joking. But, <laughs> um, and so we... Uh, Kevin and I have been friends forever. Um, we just, just always hung out. And we talk about this stuff like in the car. And as I started going to the church, I started preaching there once a month and helping stuff. And then eventually we just brought our conversations on the stage because why not? And so we're just talking about dynamics and differences and justice and da 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 
Um, and then, then, then all the stuff that you saw, you know, the past seven, eight years started flaring up and started getting prominence and stuff like that. And a lot of the things we were already talking about and stuff we were already seeing that wasn't getting news coverage was now getting news coverage. And we're talking about it. Uh, and, we, and, and it was the summer when, um, from a, back on a race piece, when Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and the five Dallas officers all got murdered within very close proximity of each other. And for all intents and purposes, all sides cared a lot at that moment. It wasn't, a, it was just like everybody was hurt, like what is going on? And so we, 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 we dug in it at our church and, and God did something, ama- the spirit just did something crazy in the hearts of our, it didn't matter what side, because our church is pretty split with a lot of ideology and stuff. It, w- it was like, everybody was like, yo, what does God want us to do for each other? So we started calling other churches, calling pastor friends, like, hey man, like, what y'all doing? Like, how y'all addressing this? How's it going? What's happening? Um, and, and a lot of our friends were like, bro, we don't know what to say or do. I'm scared I'm going to step on this landmine and these folks going to leave my church. I'm scared I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to say too little. I'm going to say it wrong. I don't know enough. And I started to get a heart for churches who genuinely cared from a leadership perspective, but legit was like, I'm in this position and I don't know what to do. So we just said, we don't know what to do either. We're just figuring it out. You know, some people send us an angry email because we messed up. Why don't we all get breakfast and figure it out? And we just called a bunch of churches together. Like 40 pastors showed up. And we were like, oh, people really care about this. And the cool thing was, it was pastors who wouldn't normally get in the room, not because they hate each other, they probably had some disagreements, but their social circles, just, they just wouldn't cross, right? Um, and I, that had me thinking about, why wouldn't they ever cross? They're all in the kingdom, right? And, and what that led to was um, us doing some talks and churches and co- conferences and colleges and stuff like that, just saying, here's where we are, here's what's happening, here's, I think, how the church has an answer to deal with it. Um, and, that, and fast forward to 2020, uh, the world shut down in March, uh, all this stuff is going on, it's, just, it's a traumatic year we, we're still not recovered from, right? And, uh, and, and, and also with new traumas. But we just said, hey man, there's a lot of marching going on, I'm not anti-marching at all. Uh, I'm anti some stuff that happens here, but I'm not anti-marching. I was like, we, there's a lot of stuff going on in the name of like justice and anti, we need to do a march. It's just, so we just got together and said, hey, man, how do we march and just say we need two things? We need Jesus and we need justice. That's all I want to talk about. When I tell you June 2020 um, was one of the highlights of my life because that is the closest I've ever seen in this life to seeing every nation, tribe, and tongue in person. I have never seen a, a hundred churches showed up. About 5,000 people came out. And like... I've never seen such a diverse gathering of believers, and not just in look. I'm talking about in everything. I mean, you had every sign and shirt you could imagine, and I'm like, man, there's a fight about to break out somewhere out here. No. People were together. They were proudly on their sides and chanting their chant, doing their thing. But, man, we took it to Jesus. We're like, Lord, we can't fix this. We need you. And I saw people marching together, arms around each other, who would never hug this person because they represent the enemy. I saw people who don't like police laying hands on and praying for and with police. I saw, I'm, I'm telling you it was the most beautiful thing. And I was like, Jesus, I don't know if I'm going to ever see that again. But I do know we can do it. I know it's possible for the church to say, hey, we, 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 we fight and, we, and we, we're, we're pushing against evil in this world, but we do it different than how all this other stuff is going. There's a way that the kingdom does it that works. And we got that. We have that. So why don't we do that regularly? I believe it's because of this paradigm I want to leave with you called corners. I think that we all have corners. Now think, imagine a house, right? Four corners in the house, you're building a house. Everybody has a corner. And in that corner, for whatever that corner represents, people look like me, act like me, think like me, talk like me, vote like me, like the same sports team, or like Marvel movies like me. I don't know. Pick your thing. I love superhero movies, especially the new Batman one. It was amazing. Uh, Yep, Batman? Yeah, it was great. Um, It was really good. I saw it twice. So, find my corner with my people, find my tribe. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing inherently wrong with that. We're tribal people. That's what we do. That's cool. Oh, you're a racist. No, these are my people. Nothing wrong with it. I don't care. Across the room, there's another corner where people look, think, and act like whatever, whatever, and they have, and you have shared language, shared commonality, shared thoughts, and all that that comes out of that. Nothing wrong with this at all. 
challenge is that there's a, a worldview that's developed there and a set of lenses through which I view everything. And so uh, the language that you say over there and the stuff you believe over there, when it comes through my filter, means something different over here and over there. And because I hear that thing differently over here, I think that you're that. And we're shouting at each other from our corners when 90% of the time we're saying the exact same thing. Right? Y'all with me? Does that make sense? Yes, no? Hello? Okay, so like, <laughs> so it's just that, that issue. So somebody over here says all lives matter. And, and I mean, you can't read the book of scripture and not think that's not true. Yes, Imago day, 100% all lives matter. Of course they do. But over here it says, oh man, I'm just trying to say that I feel less value. My black life, I'm just trying to say that and you won't even let me say that. So you squash it with the response thinking that I'm saying you don't matter. That's not what, and, 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 and right points being made on all sides, but the argumentation is going on and you're forced to pick a side to be with your tribe and your folks, right? Somebody over here says, uh, you know, social justice, and that means, oh, man, liberal, SJW, American hating anarchists over here, and then somebody over here is like, I'm a patriot. That means, oh, so you only want to uphold the white supremacy. And which one of these is wrong? Like, this, uh, this, this, why is it wrong to be a patriot? Why is it wrong to fight for justice? You have to pick a side because we've been told we have to sit in our corners. You have to pick. I don't know when and where, I'm pro-life, I don't know when and where pro-life and social justice got divided as issues you can't both agree on. That's, that's, a, that's a social justice issue. But nah, because you got to pick your team that you vote for, because you got to pick your issue, because we're only dealing with one, and you better pick which one. And the Bible says yes and yes to both of these. So I'm trying to figure out, when did we let the corners become more important than the gospel? So the only answer I have is... Can I, can I get out of my corner and maybe come to the center of the room just a little bit? Maybe not all the way in yours, but I'm here, though. I say, hey, man, meet, meet me. Can we just exchange lenses? Would you, would, you, would you explain to me when I say this what you hear and why? And, like, I just want to see things the way you see them. I want to kick it. I want to hang out. I want to understand a little bit more about what's going on. And maybe that's the third conversation. Maybe we just get barbecued for the first two and we don't even get to that because you're not my Christian project. I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to win my thing. I just want to be with you because, you know what? Uh, if you would name the name of Jesus like I do and you've genuinely repented and believed, we're going to be doing that forever anyway. Why don't we get started right now? Yeah? Ladies and gentlemen, we are wasting time splitting over things that are important instead of unifying on things that are critical. One of my best buddies in this world, I didn't know anything about his politics for eight, nine years in our relationship. Never came up. I didn't care. We just like to eat, so we hang out. <laughs> we watched our kids grow up. Stuff starts flaring up, right? I'm hanging out. Conversation pops off. I find out we're on different sides of a thing, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. And as things popped up, you know, those, those, we were tempted to go further and further this way. And I was, and you know, we got into a knockdown, drag out argument one time where his wife was like, oh my God, I thought you were friends. And we're like, ah, oh no, we good, we good. Ah, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's stuff I'm passionate about. And he said stuff to me that had me like, oh man, I ain't even see that. And I said stuff to him like, bro, this is a problem. Look up Tamir Rice. He's like, who is Tamir Rice? I'm like, Google it and call me back. And he called me back in tears. Like, bro, I had, I didn't, my circle didn't talk about this. I said, I know, mine didn't talk about if we don't come out of our corners, we just keep shouting from across the room, and we never build a house because we just were focused on our corner. Now the house is lopsided. What's my point? I pray that when I'm thinking about what Jesus' agenda is, because everybody thinks Jesus votes for their guy because, you know, whatever. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. But I see Jesus on the cross, arms stretched out, literally metaphorically, physically, reaching out to two guys beside him who both deserve to be there, or to the left and to the right. One of them repents, we don't know who, <laughs> and they receive the benefits of this sacrifice, but he's reaching out. And then he's looking down at the people who put him there. He's looking at the guy who's about to hit him with a spear. And he says, Father, forgive them. He doesn't know what he's doing. And Jesus sees your face and mine. 2,000 years down the road and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing either. But I'm still going to die for them and give them the chance to receive this sin payment so that they can be reconciled to you. And then we give them the ministry of reconciliation and they take that message. We have to get back to work with that. Listen, 
Keep your convictions as long as it's biblical. Vote for who you vote for as long as it's, oh, yeah, that's my shut up timer, sorry. My wife told me not to do that. She's like, you know you're, you're going to get carried away. I was like, I know. <laughs> she knows me. 16 years in, man, she know what it is. But I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't care who you voted for. I don't. I don't. I th- I'm sure you didn't vote for this person because they like killing babies and vote for this person because they hate minorities. And that's just a blanket statement, but that's what people, that's what we do to each other from our corner. I'm sure that's not why you voted for them. Maybe you did, but I, you know, don't, don't raise your hand on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we have to get in the room and get to the center and say, guys, Jesus died for something greater than this. And while I would love to put you in the box because it's easier for me to understand and bring you in the kingdom or kick you out based on this position. I think Jesus died for something more than that. And I think he wants us to replicate it. So what do we then do? What do we do? I'm going to skip that next scripture and the next ray. We must be willing to stand in the gospel alone and leave our corners behind. That doesn't mean you leave your tribe. That doesn't mean you leave your people. Maybe it does. But it just says, hey, man, I'm, I just want to be intentional with my life. I care a lot more about who's at our dinner tables and who's in our church. Because who's at your dinner table and in your life, that'll impact here. But that matters more, I think, in reconciliation and kingdom. And then this happens. I care more about who's at your dinner table than who's at your church. I need to leave my corner to get somebody who doesn't just look, think, and act like me at my dinner table. And for me, at theirs. And that matters. It's not just a... I did it, check the box activity. This is Jesus inviting the 12 around. He had people that did not deserve to be there. They shouldn't have been there. They were for competing places. You had people like, Jesus, are you sure you want him in the camp? Like, Levi shouldn't be here and Judas. Like, and Jesus like, bring him, bring him on. I want to be like that in my life. I don't want to have boxes and corners. I don't. So what do we do? Uh, I think number one, we just repent. We repent. We turn from everything that's not like Jesus, and we receive the gospel. It says, I have a debt that I can't pay um, because of thoughts, actions, and deeds, sins of commission, omission. Uh, And and it was so deep, the, the lack of holiness was so far, even though I don't fully fathom it, that God himself had to step off of the throne and pay my penalty because he's the only one who could give pay the capital punishment required and then bring himself back from the grave and then give it to me if I trusted and took that on my account. So I need to repent and believe that and then understand that he said, go and give that message away. This is your job. Don't care where you end up vocationally. This is your job in the kingdom and do it for the 70, 80, 90 years you have here and then experience the fruit of your labor forever with every nation, tribe and tongue. We repent, we believe, and then what we do is we just come out of our corner. Say, hey, guys, I don't not believe what we believe. I just, I want to go meet them. I want to go meet who this is. I want them in my life. I want to be in theirs. We're not going to agree, and we're going to mess this up. I'm going to say something dumb. They're going to say something dumb. I, Jesus didn't die for me not to say stuff dumb. He died for me to be intentional about going to my brother and my sister and saying, listen, if you don't know the gospel, I want to be able to demonstrate that to you. If you do know the gospel, why are we not like this, even when we have a minor riff? Back to Ephesians 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Again, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I just want to highlight that as a point. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That is our job. So whether we're talking race, inequity, systematic things, preschool to prison pipeline, privatized prison systems, whether we're talking that, whether we're talking two-way, keep the guns, take the guns, whether we're t- whatever we're talking about, if we put the name of Christ in our life, our job is to not, the, the gospels are, the Bible says the gospel's an offense. There's no way around the gospel being offensive. Like, you're not going to get over that. That is there. We don't need to add to it by being equally offensive and divisive ourselves. Like, nobody wants to hear that they got to repent and believe right? So when we accept that, we say, listen, I need you to understand the great love of this God who reconciled men and women, nation, tribe, and tongue, all together, socioeconomics, political leaders, poor, everybody. He died for that. He died for that. And I believe that the only answer we have for this is the gospel, is the power of God, 
We're not going to legislate it. We're not going to vote it. We're not going to picket it. We're not going to argue it. None of that. It hasn't worked so far. Still vote. Still do all that stuff. I'm for that stuff. But the answer has to be in the gospel. So um, I would like to end today with a spoken word piece uh, called The Power of God. I hope that the art and the words in that encourage you as you go forward to be ministers of reconciliation in whatever way God has for you, in whatever conversation he has for you, in whatever relationships you need to fix, mend, start, begin, uh, whatever it is. Uh, even, you know, I just pray that um, the solution we, we, we fall into and trust as those who would name Jesus as Lord and Savior would be uh, the gospel, the power of God. That's the only answer I think we have. So I hope you enjoy this piece. unto salvation, isn't it? I wonder if sometimes our place is wasted with it. Did we mistake his gift of life and the grace is given and make decisions contrary to his prescriptions? Rumors of war, missiles pointed at nations, missing peaceful conversations. We prefer to raise our pistols. We prefer to raise divisions. He tore the wall down. We build them up, kick against the pricks. What an amazing scrimmage. In the womb, God knit us together in his image, but don't believe in his beginning. So how is ending? What's the difference? Since 73, we're about to cross 60 million. Fight for the rights of children, then abort them with it. Look over there, see genocide and ethnic cleansing. Look over here, see racial division. We still don't get it. Look outside, find a place to blame our sickness, blame the atheists who in turn blames all religious systems. Wonder what we're missing. If there's a God, where is he? Where in all of this is? God's omnipotence here. I can't get a grip here. The only thing that is clear, if there's utopia, we are not here. The distant echo from heaven is do not fear. Maybe we can fix it. We can go on mission, build safe houses, rescue women, clothe the homeless, feed the hungry, care for those in sickness, visit prisons, serve the poor, orphan, and widow, build pregnancy centers, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and get politicians who will legislate for that fetus, be the answer for every situation in its worst case, but need to answer why we in the state in the first place. See, all of these are good ideas. I would argue God ideas when we pray this way. I still believe that it's God who hears all these efforts I will cheer. But count of all is lost if we never point man to the fact that God appeared and into the Father, set the stage for Golgotha, and into the Son, who was foretold by the prophets, exiting heaven. He left behind all of his prophet, existing infinitely on time and inside him. Left his riches to walk beside the impoverished. Left his throne for those who worship everything that's not him. The full power of God encapsulated in his construct. The majestic sacrifice for those who would mock him. See, we turned away from life. And in our sins, we got stuck, enslaved in our iniquity. In our chains, we got judged, death barreling towards us. He stepped in front to stop blood, the blood of the divine, the only key that could unlock us. So where's the power of God? It's in the eternal vindication of enemies of the God man, given direct by God's hands, full of grace and truth, giving us the way we did not plan. Into the problem how only my God can see. Here's the bad news. We were removed from his countenance to be separated forever by our sinless mountainous eternal life available from the very one who fashioned us the good news is he stepped in our death to get us out of it this is so immaculate conceive the unconceivable the heaven could reach down to redeem the unredeemable could you believe the unbelievable a poor jewish man from nazareth his death and resurrection is the only key for you that he would hit the cross and leave for you that he would even beseech for you father forgive them they don't know what they even mean to do that he would ascend above it all he would take the seed of truth every tumble confess to his lord and every knee will too and add his name all of creation takes a pause and heaven gives a thunderous applause and stands in him in awe recognizing the supremacy of god his idea to put his son upon the cross the creator of it all would trade his holy son for those who's lost it's not possible to calculate this cost and i'll never be ashamed that the power of god will never be in our deeds but indeed the gospel of God now gaze at him in awe.
Thank you, brother. Uh, while you're going to remain standing, and how do you, how do you follow that? <laughs> you know, you, you just don't. Um, but I would love to. I just want to invite you to pray with me. Would you bow your heads with me? And uh, I said this in the early hour. You know, the line that kept staring at me was was come to the center, and then. In order to do that, I have to repent. Like all of us. We all have work to, to do here. There's nobody that came into the room or watching online that says, I have all this figured out. We all have work to do here. But I am reminded it is impossible for you to do the work if you don't first have a relationship with Jesus. One of the things that legend said was, the reconciling starts between God and man. God reconciled the world and is reconciling the world to himself through the person of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection for your sin and for my sin. So before you can even do the work of being reconciled to your neighbor, to your brother, to your sister, it is being reconciled to the God of the universe through trusting in Jesus. So in this room, standing in this room, if you've never been reconciled to God through accepting Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that's where you start. You start there first. God, please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Cleanse me of my sin. Remake me. Make me a new creation. And he will in a second. And then we want to help you in that journey. Like So as you're trusting him, and maybe you've never asked him into your life before, and today, you just surrendered. You said, Jesus, come into my life. We want to help you with that walk. But if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have trusted him as your Lord and Savior, you have the message of reconciliation living with inside of you in the Holy Spirit. He gives you the power to deny yourself, come to the center and love those around you. So I don't know what your prayer is today for you, if it's to confess your sin and invite Jesus into your life or it, if it, as a follower of Jesus, it's just to repent and say, I even, Father, if I'm honest, I feel like I have this figured out and I'm realizing like I got, I got, space here to go I have room to grow over a couple a year and a half ago we had this series called around the table inviting you to hospitality to to come around the table not with people that are in your corner only people don't look like you people in a different socioeconomic space than you, but coming together, genuinely loving one another and having great conversation. So maybe that's a move you need to make out of this weekend. Have some dinner, have coffee, really begin to engage. Several weeks back, I sat down with a lady in the LGBT community black lady, just, I just love her so much. We are on, we think differently about a lot of stuff, but we were able just to come to the table and hang out, and for me to listen, her to listen, we didn't leave the table agreeing in everything, we just left the table loving one another. So let's do that.
let's carry this message of reconciliation. Let's take it seriously. And let's put the effort in. Let's bring the kingdom of God, all of its values and vision, let's bring that to earth. Let's not waste any more time. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. It's unending. You did not measure us up before you died for us. You just loved us, entered into this world, and died for us. Rose again three days later, conquered death, sin, the grave, to give us life, to give it to it the full, give us purpose, and entrust us with this message of reconciliation and love and grace. Like, help us to extend grace to a world that's looking and give us the power through your Holy Spirit. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus.